I'm Connor Old, and welcome back to another episode of Connor the Contrarian, a weekly podcast where I talk about movies that were disliked by either the critics or the audiences, and talk about why I think it's actually a great movie. Today, I'll be talking about the young auteur Harmony Corinne's pop violent portrayal of youth culture, particularly its obsession with spring break in the movie Spring Breakers. Now, before I jump into things, I always like to talk about the cultural landscape of the movie so we get a better understanding as to why it didn't do well on its initial release. Now, I remember this movie coming out very clear- clearly. I remember seeing all the marketing of Selena Gomez and Vanessa Hudgens in bikinis and partying, and I remember people of my age group getting very excited about this movie. These were the Disney Channel stars that I grew up with, and now seeing them cut loose was this very interesting prospect to a teenage boy. And I remember everyone watching, including myself, and pretty much us unanimously hating it. Uh, we kind of got what we wanted, but it was filled with this art house feel and meaning that was maybe too hard to comprehend. Uh, now, I don't put that entirely upon myself not understanding it, because I do think the marketing was definitely misleading, trying to make it something that it wasn't. But despite this movie earning $30 million on a $5 million budget, it had an abysmal audience score and even mixed critical reviews. The critics seeming to agree that this was the director's best film. However, they hated his other films, uh, so it didn't really meet their judgment. And this was very different than his other films and really different for any film and a film this new and this different. It's kind of understandable that it's misunderstood at the time, but let's just jump into the movie, starting with the opening sequence. We open to a montage of people on spring break with Skrillex's scary monsters and nice spirits. They're doing the typical party stuff, drinking at the beach with their shirts off. Uh, They're sporting bright colored swimsuits. uh, um, And we are immediately launched into this intense debauchery. This feels like there's no beginning, middle, or end. It's just a state of being. We then cut to black where we hear a gunshot and see our protagonist hanging out. We see their school life, and we're introduced to Candy, played by Vanessa Hudgens, and Brett, played by Ashley Benson. They're bored, and they're not paying attention in class because they're just looking for spring break. Then we get a nice sort of direct contrast as we cut to a Christian youth group where Jeff Jarrett, former pro wrestler, plays a pastor. And he's energetic. He's amped about Jesus, and so are the kids. Then we meet Faith, played by Selena Gomez, a member of the, uh, the youth group. And, you know, a little on the nose, but uh, it's this cut from the girls in class not paying attention to Faith at this Christian group that gives Faith this outsider status. She immediately feels like she's our protagonist and she'll be launched to a world that she's totally not ready for. Uh, We learn that her and the other girls are planning on going to Florida for spring break. And although Faith isn't particularly close with these girls, they've been friends, friends since kindergarten. So there's a loyalty there. And this youth group sequence really is a sequence as it slowly eases us into the visual language of the film. It feels almost like a music video, where it's not a scene with an over-the-shoulder dialogue shot that cuts to a reaction shot, sort of the typical scene you see in any movie. It's different. There's audio laced with other images. For example, we hear the youth pastor speak as we see Faith smoke outside. Uh, we see the youth group sit. We start hear the youth group singing. Excuse me, as we see Brett squirting alcohol into her mouth with a water gun. And the camera has this floating quality mixed with the rapid editing, and really messes with your experience. But that's just at the beginning. This is just a taste of uh, what's to come. Eventually, we get introduced to Cody, played by Ra- Rachel Corinne, as we see the girls late at night having fun with each other. It's filmed in this very innocent way, almost sleepover-esque, uh, sort of allowing the audience to understand the childlike sensibilities that these girls are still, they're in uh, college, but they are still young. But they realize that they don't have enough money, which is heartbreaking to them. This was supposed to be their chance to escape. They're sick of seeing the same thing every single day. They're miserable. Once again, harping on this idea of teenage restlessness, and they think that this over-the-top exercise of excess will solve their problems. But they need the money, and they want to go to spring break. So they decide to rob a restaurant, and here we have this great long shot, being in the passenger seat of the car, as we start at the front of the restaurant and slowly go to the back, as we see them robbing the store through the windows, and it's at a distance. The reality of their behavior isn't at the forefront just yet, but now they have the money and they're going to spring break. 
And now is when we see Corinne's visual style to the max. He has his extended sequences of audio contrasted by these stark visuals, these bright neon colors and intense electronic music, which, by the way, I mean, the film has a great soundtrack, but an even better electronic score by Cliff Martinez. The camera really portrays the mass of bodies in an intimate and sexual way. The entire movie now feels like the opening sequence, and it's really cool because we see this contrasting audio of Faith's phone call to her grandma as the girls are riding mopeds and at pool parties and at the beach. So we have this sort of innocent conversation about, oh, I want to bring you next year. You know, she's saying this to her grandma, despite uh, them sort of going and doing these uh, crazy, I mean, intense sort of party sequences with, you know, hundreds of people, it seems like. It's it's pretty insane. Um, And the whole idea of sort of this entire sequence is that we don't see them really doing anything. We don't see them in the act of buying the mopeds. We are just in the constant. We just see the actions and never the lead up. This really extends this music video feel and it's almost too much in ways, but the editing gives it a great flow of the shots are just so seamlessly intertwined. Corinne calls it liquid narrative because it isn't the tr- traditional narrative. These girls are just sort of practicing and sort of indulging in this excess. excess. It's just everything that gives you sort of pure pleasure. It's hedonism in by definition. Uh, and we see sort of Corinne eventually going to start commentating on the, the sort of pure hedonism that it is. So we have a bit of a break because it does eventually become too much with a sequence outside of a diner at night where the girls bring up the robbery again. We have intercut close-ups, images of the girls from inside the restaurant as they reenact what they did. Um, And for the first time, Faith is really confronted by the reality. She didn't care where the money came from before, but now Faith and by virtue, us, the audience, are really having to face what these girls did. Corinne shoots all these party montages as 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 a magical place where there's no law, but reality is poking its head up from this fantastical place. Uh, Just as one long, never-ending party with no consequences until there are, and they get arrested. Reality once again poking its head up to remind the girls and the audience what they really wanted out of this trip. But but luckily for them, they get bailed out by a local rapper named Alien, played by James Franco, who does an incredible job because Alien is, well, alien. (laughs) He has tattoos and grills. He's got dreadlocks, these big sunglasses. He looks almost like a modern day SoundCloud rapper before they existed. Uh, He's got this really alluring quality, but you're you're still cautious. And he speaks in this weird way where he's, it's almost like an Instagram poet come to life. And before where we use the narration of Faith and her call with her grandma, now we have sort of a lot of narration with Alien and his sort of quiet whispering in his sort of poetic way and sort of off kilter way of talking is very unique and James Franco plays it really well because he's almost like he's an actor putting on a performance because this guy is just trying to put on a performance and put on uh, sort of a, a way of looking and that he thinks is cool or what he's sort of raised to be um, and the scary thing is that he doesn't really have a reason as to why why he bailed these girls out. And Faith, out of everyone, is suspicious when they decide to go to Alien's party. You know, this is not what she signed up for. We're not hanging out with the other college kids at the nice hotels. No, no, no. We're hanging out with the locals, the suppliers of the drugs that got them in the jail in the first place. She's super uncomfortable. And in an intimate scene, Alien and Faith uh, talk about leaving. And Alien runs his hand across her face and the camera spins around them in this really tight close-up. It's very sort of uh, intimate, but you see the visual distress that Faith is in and how Alien is trying to comfort her, but it's just coming off super creepy and possessive. And there's this weird, really power imbalance going on here. You know, he bailed them out so they don't want to be rude and in a way kind of owns them for a bit because they ran out of their money. They got arrested, so they probably got kicked out of their their motel. So they they don't know what to do, and they sort of just are going along with what's happening. Um, But ultimately, Faith leaves, and Faith being the protagonist of this movie, and the character that we most of us relate to, and really the moral center of this movie, leaves. And things, as we know it, they can't get any better. The girls are in too deep. 
we had this funny scene, uh, this MTV crib style, if you may, uh, scene where Alien just shows off all of his guns and his money, you know. The, the quote, you know, I've got Scarface on repeat, best movie, or uh, Calvin Klein Escape, I smell good, you know, these sort of really ridiculous, as very funny, but very ridiculous, because the girls are, are super into it. It's this com- sort of commitment in their belief of pop culture, that this is what they want, to, this is what they wanted when they saw all the rap songs glorify this, that they're coming coming up close and personal and they really love it they they love the instant gratification of having money and power it's alluring to them but for the audience the scene is played comically because we know that this is just a low-life gangster trying to show off we see the uh hypocrisy and sort of the the fakeness that this guy is and now corinne is really commenting on this lifestyle there are consequences to the spring break mindset. He's almost like he's holding a, a mirror to the audience. We enjoy the beginning portions despite the shallowness. And now it's saying almost as if this is what we want. By trying to emulate and glorify this pop culture mindset, we are almost asking for destruction. We as an audience may have also left with faith, but when we don't is when our distorted values of, of what's cool becomes clear and these values really are distorted because it's we there's a sort of connection between the beginning scenes and this a narrative connection that feels organic um just because these two worlds really are closer than we think but we eventually run to gucci Mane, the rapper who plays a local rival drug kingpin and he doesn't like the competition from Alien, and we really see the the havoc they're creating in one of the best scenes of the movie. Uh, we have Alien playing the piano on his Oceanside house as the girls in pink ski masks are holding shotguns, as they sing Every Time by Britney Spears. Then there's this montage of them robbing people and shooting into the air, uh, and uh, this is Corinne's ultimate contrast. We have some of the most horrific acts going on with this easygoing melody that is the song. It desensitizes what is going on. The reality that was occasionally brought up isn't brought up anymore, and the fact that no one is even mentioning it makes it even more disturbing. It's turned into a full-out horror movie. The dark side that was let out during the, the parting have totally let loose, and we see who these girls really are, and it's frightening. It's beautifully shot, there's an amazing slow motion, but this whole sequence is haunting. Still, these actions once can have consequences, and in an altercation with Gucci Mane, Cotty gets shot, and reality comes back uh, for the for final time in the movie, and she decides to leave. So now they need their revenge. And in the final scene of the movie, they go to Gucci Mane's crib with uh, guns that he has, and the, uh, with guns, and he has this really long neon bridge with lots of security, and the line that was said at the beginning of the film that sort of mirrored now uh, the idea of, you know, just just pretend it's a video game that is really sort of rearing its head again. Um, Alien dies right away, but the girls barely even stop for him. They don't really care that much. They continue going and end up shooting their way through the entire house as they fail, as their, their final phone call uh, to their parents talk about how everyone here is so nice and there's a, this orchestral version of Skrillex song which is also used at the beginning of the movie uh, with them eventually killing Gucci Mane as they ride off into sunset with an orange Lamborghini. This ending is very reminiscent of the beginning even using the same song but a different version showing how these two wor- worlds are a lot in a lot of ways similar to one another how the beginning of that party ultimately sort of leaves leaves what happens at the end that you can have all this sort of pleasure at the beginning but that sort of leaves a void in a lot of places when they leave when it's over and you know what is it fueling what is it helping out and sort of helping out this culture that's sort of sustained uh, um, in these sort of uh, lower class neighborhoods it's very interesting contrast and very a total ending it's a great ending because it totally mirrors what's going on from the beginning of the movie and this movie as a whole is hypnotic. It's mesmerizing. It's neon aesthetic with its floating camera and stark contrast creates a unique audiovisual experience, unlike anything I've ever seen. At the beginning, we have these phone calls, and then eventually we transition into Alien's poetic narration as he, as he whispers quietly. It leaves the viewer with this uncomfortable experience. 
we know that this partying shouldn't have led to this, yet it still feels organic. It's a pop song turned nightmare. That every, everything we consume in pop culture is just the surface level of this. And that this movie shows how ridiculous our sort of obsession with crime is. That's why the girls die in the end. There are no repercussions to the, the, their actions. And that's kind of the scary thing is that they sort of go away with doing whatever they want. And it's the lack of re repercussions that occur that makes it kind of haunting. Because they don't get their comeuppance in the end. That's sort of what we've been trained from all these movies, that the bad guys get their comeuppance. comeuppance. And because these girls don't, and because they're protagonists, we have this sort of weird uh, feeling towards it. It's very unique. Because they're the heroes of this extended music video. And it's only its lack of reality near the end that turns to us, the audience. It's like walking into a haunted house at a carnival, and you enter into one of those mirror mazes where the scary part is just how... It's reflected onto us. It's Is this the modern day American dream? Is this what the girls want? Is this what we are striving to do by sort of ingraining into our pop culture? This, this is the idea of success. Is this what the youth is sort of growing up to? It's a very interesting look at culture, you know, something we all consume in some way or another. And it asks if this is what we really want, because this is what it really is. The girls lust after self-destruction, even if they don't know it. It has this sugar pop surface on the outside, but when you look deeper, you just find old concrete. It's cold, solid, and full of cracks. As a matter of fact, I feel the same way I felt after Goodfellas. In Goodfellas, I was really invested into the narrative. I love the characters, and you just get sort of invested into this crime. But then when the, the police show up, you get sort of into this trance of you're you're like oh why right there's police uh, they exist this world has consequences in the same way here where you're enjoying the partying but then you realize that oh no this actually has consequences this film is more than its first half or its misguided marketing it is a true and honest reflection of our behavior stylized in the music video style we all obsess over because spring breakers is a great movie I'm Connor Rold. Make sure you rate and review the podcast on iTunes. That really helps. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel where I post various film content. Uh, you can check that out. Just search my name, Connor Rold, on YouTube. You can also follow me on Twitter, at Connor Rold. I, I tweet uh, occasionally. Uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the, the podcast. And until next time, spring break forever.